Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Dowden and in this video, we're going to be making music like Alex Orion. Alex Orion is a progressive house artist signed to labels such as Sudbeat, Lost and Found, and he is a huge influence of mine. I absolutely love his music. I've been receiving tons of comments asking for me to do a video of Alex Orion. I heard you and I am happy to do that for you. Three most important things are going to be his bass lines, which sound like this. The drums and percussion are very groovy, very hooky, and they sound like this. And then topping it all off, we have those beautiful melodies that just carry out the track, fill the entire spectrum, and they sound a little bit like this. So let's go ahead and get started. But before that, make sure to hit that subscribe button with notifications on so you get more videos like this one and to hit that like button to show everybody else how much you enjoyed this video because it's going to be great. Okay, so we're going to get started. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to get started. And the first thing I'm going to show you is the kick drum. So the kick here sounds like this. It's a pretty punchy kick. It's something that I made myself by EQing and layering and compressing some other layers together. I will give you this kick as part of the sample pack. Um, and this kick is nice and short. A lot of these Alex Orion tracks and Progressive House tracks, they have this nice, really punchy, short kick. So it's not like a really long sustained kick. You can see that the sub is not very long. The entire sample is not very long. And the reason for that is that it doesn't take up as much as the low end. So we have room for our bass lines and it's not so uh, aggressive and kind of doesn't pull your attention away as much as other kicks would. And it kind of just complements the entire groove rather than making the kick such a focal point as it is in so many other tracks. At least that's my take on it, and uh, that's why I've uh, included it in this version because it's very similar to the kicks that Alex makes. So now we're just going to go right to, to our bass. There's not really much to talk about the kick. Um, our bass here. So I'm going to grab an operator, and I'm going to use operator. It's something that I haven't used in my previous videos, but I like using operator for my subs because you get to control the two octaves by changing this algorithm from vertical. So this is going to be a frequency modulated synth right now, I'm going to put this into um, this horizontal algorithm here. So now we have each oscillator is going to be individual uh, and it's going to allow us to not use frequency modulation in operators. The first oscillator here is going to be just a sine wave and it's going to be uh, the chorus is at one and I'm just going to play a low A. So we got about 55, 56 hertz. If I go any lower to a lower octave of A, it's going to be a little bit too low. It's going to be hitting around 28 to 26 to 28 hertz. That's pretty low. That's something we don't hear. It's more of a feeling. And honestly, it's, it's going to be a little bit lower than I want for this track. When you're dealing with the key of A uh, and, and a couple other keys as well, uh, pretty much anything below low D, you're really, really low in the frequencies. So I'm going to do the higher octave of this still a very sub heavy frequency and then i'm going to add a second oscillator by putting this course up to two so i'm going to double it and then that's going to bring in another a but when i turn this volume up so you'll see as i'm bringing up the volume a second os uh, octave of a pop up and now i have two on a and we can add a third one if we like but we have to double it again because if we go up to three we're going to get uh an e so we have to go up to a four. And then if we wanted to add a fourth octave, we would have to go up to eight. But I don't want that. I'm just going to keep it just the two octaves for now. The sub and the middle bass there. And I might reduce that a little bit. Next, I'm going to go into the top of the bass, and that's going to be uh, the saturated sound, the mid frequencies of the sound that's going to give us that punch. It's going to give us that little bit of uh, energy that kind of lays on top of the sub so we can hear it, not just feel it. And uh, it'll be really good if you don't have you know, a subwoofer or your speakers don't produce low frequencies, you're using a cell phone or maybe headphones that don't have a lot of low end, this is where a lot of this energy and this sound is going to come from. And that's going to be uh, a serum patch that I'm going to create. It's just going to be basically a pluck, but it's going to be much lower and it's going to have just a little bit of sustain on it. The first oscillator here, I'm just going to go back one to 4088. 
and then I'm going to bring the second one. I'm going to put a sawtooth wave. Uh, I'm actually going to go to the basic shapes. Um, put my wave table to this one right here. I'm going to put my unison up here to two. This unison I'm going to put to two, but I'm going to have the detune down and this detune also down. I'm actually going to put it up to three on both of these. And the reason I put it to three is because if I turn this three, if I put this blend up like this, bring it down, I have these side, this like green on the sides. Those are the two voices that are on the side. They're going to feel wide, where the yellow one is in the middle or is mono in our mix. If we put it this way, it's going to sound really wide. We still get a bit of the width, but we have a voice that is directly in the center, and it's going to give us mono signal to work with, with the sides as well. I'm going to do that for this one as well. So I have the side signal much quieter than the, the mono signal. I believe it's mono. I'm not 100% sure if it's actually mono or if it's just not a stereo spread. Um, don't quote me on that. I'm going to put my filter on both, so both A and B. Turn my filter on, and I'm going to put this to uh, 24. And that's going to reduce 24 decibels per octave. And then I'm going to move this down a little bit. And I'll turn my EQs off for now so we can get a basic listen of everything. Resonance down. I'll turn my drive up a little bit. I, I have to control the filter with an envelope. So I'll grab envelope two. And I'm going to do a uh, decay of about, I don't know, uh, three or 400 milliseconds. Sustain, I'm going to bring down just a little bit. And the reason for that is that we have that initial punch coming through. So we have this pluck. It's going to open up the filter. It's going to go from, uh, from maybe here. It's going to open up really quickly, pretty much instantly. And then it's going to back off a little bit and sustain for about, uh, well, however long the note is sustained for. And then it's going to release over about maybe three or 400 milliseconds. And that's going to give it a little bit of a tail. And the reason I'm doing this, this, this punch, as I was saying, is because if we have it all the way to the top, it's going to be stagnant. It's going to open up the filter cutoff. It's going to stay there until we let go of the note, and then it's going to drop down. But if we have this little bit of punch, uh, sorry, this little bit of drop in the sustain, like 5 or 10%, it's going to open up a little bit more and then drop down to that sustained amount. And it's going to give us a tiny bit more punch. And let's throw that envelope on. Maybe a, a little bit less. That's okay. Bring this down. Oops. Bring this down. A little bit of release on this as well. About the same and decay down as well. I'll do the same thing with the sustain, just a little bit. I'm going to bring this down a little bit more and then put this octave down as well. Next, I'm going to add a bit of multiband compression. And this is like the very similar to the OTT. So I'm going to go in here, compressor, multiband, and I'm going to bring the high end just down a little bit. Bring the mid up a little bit and down, uh, bring down the low. I end just a little bit more down. I don't want it that crispy. Cool. And that's our sound. Let me turn up the master a little bit. And it has nice saturated sound, but it's not too aggressive. Next, I'm going to draw in the actual bass line here. We'll solo the bass. And we'll solo the kick. What I like to do with my bass lines is I like to imagine them in my head as I'm playing the song, or I like to just kind of say them out loud. So a lot of the time, I actually will say the bass lines before putting them in to the DAW because I want to make sure that they sound groovy. And it's easier to me to actually, you know, feel the groove and say it out loud, feel what works, than it is to go in and try to write randomly as I go. So I just listen to the kick. And then I'll just do. Something like that. So then I just go ahead and write that in. 
I'm gonna do 16th notes. Sounds pretty uh, Alex O'Ryan ish. Cool. I'm going to change the wave table a little bit. It's a little bit more aggressive. I'm going to turn the master down a bit. And then I'm going to uh, play this with the kick. And then I'm gonna add in my sub. So I'm just gonna copy this over, check the octave here. So it's a bit high. So I'll grab everything here and bring it down. Check on my EQ. Looking good. Go back to here. I'm gonna actually EQ out the low end. Because I know that I have this octave already. Right on my sub here, I can check. I have that octave at around 112 hertz. So I don't want to double that up here. So I'm going to cut out all the way up to 112 hertz. And then I scoop out some of these frequencies here. It's a little bit less muddy. Cool. And then I'm going to make sure that I definitely am side chaining this to the kick. It's really, really important because we are playing the kick the same time as that sub. So either I'm going to get rid of that sub when it's hitting, which I think I'm actually going to do, uh, and just let the kick play there and have the bass line come in. And then I'll have this uh, side chain to the kick as well, just to make sure. Just a little bit. I'm going to turn this up a little bit with the utility because it's not very loud. Get rid of the tuner. Cool, so now we have our kick and our bass line. I'm actually going to lower this an octave and see how it sounds. Pretty cool, and I don't want a, that much of the sustain. I'm going to bring it down just a little bit more and my cutoff just a tiny, tiny bit more. A little bit of resonance. I just reduced the low a little bit in the compressor and brought up the mid a little bit and the high a little bit. Sounds pretty good. So the drums, there is a lot going on. And what I did is I created a drum loop with a bunch of different percussive elements that I have. Uh, and you can just listen to what they sound like on their own. So a really important thing about this type of progressive is you want percussive elements in one of two ways. One is to kind of fill up some of the empty space in a more subtle way. It's a little bit more background noise. It's not very obvious. You want it to kind of just make it not feel so robotic and, and more organic of a sound. And the other way is to make the sounds very obvious and very hooky and to make them feel like they're bringing the track forward and they're keeping your attention. So I've kind of done both here. And uh, Alex does this in a lot of his tracks where he has just one or two elements that are just so catchy and they're very prominent, but they're not stealing the show. They're not taking away too much of the focus. They're just there to add a bit of an energy that carries the track along. So I have this example of all these congos that I added. And then I have this other layer here. the kick. So really this last layer here is more of the subtle layer. So if we listen to just these, it's pretty catchy. Um, but this extra layer here is the one that really adds that little bit of texture. Mm -hmm. 
I definitely want to add a little bit of reverb to that as well. So I'm going to put that into, um, I'm just going to bring a reverb onto the channel itself. So adding that little bit of texture kind of makes that a little bit more interesting on a subconscious level where these drums are a little bit more hooky and they're a little bit more uh, to, to catch your attention and keep the track flowing. Really, really important thing to note is that these have to or should be most of the time in key. I have a tuner that I like to put in all my drums because if you don't tune your drums, they can start to sound really wonky. So you want to make sure that your drums are most of the time in the same key. It doesn't have to always be the same note, but that it works in the key that you're writing in, or else it can start to sound a little bit awkward and a little bit out of place. It's definitely more important for instruments like toms and bongos and congas. Not so much your high-end percussion like your hats and cymbals. It carries enough weight that you can hear the note behind it, per se. Uh, then I think it's worth tuning. Okay, so now I'm going to work on the hi-hat. So I have... Uh, quite a few hi-hats going on and in Alex's tracks there is usually quite a lot going on in the in the top end of the track. So we have our percussion that is groovy that's going to carry the track along but then we also have this um, you know really wide high high end the hi-hats but it's also very prominent in the middle so it's very strong mono signal but also very wide so it works on club systems that are in mono or sound systems that are in mono but it also has that width so if you're listening in a good uh, listening environment you can hear the width of it. I have this wide hat here. What I've done is I've transposed it down so that it sits better in the mix and as I was saying about pitching your, your drums to be in key. And then I've added a reverb here to give it just a little bit more tail end because that tail end kind of helps carry the, the, the hat through the mix a little bit more. It's not so punchy and not so uh, choppy. It kind of blends it a little bit more together. And then I'm actually add a compressor. And with the compressor, I want to kind of actually reduce the punchiness even more. I want this hi-hat to be wide, but I want it to not be so punchy, but I want it to kind of just fill the sides of the, of the speaker, sides of the spectrum, uh, and just to sound, like I said, nice and wide, but very full sounding. So I'm going to put a compressor with a pretty heavy ratio, and I'm actually going to put the attack to zero. And see how now, without the compressor, it's punchy. But with the compressor, the tail end is almost as loud as the punch. And then I'm going to put this up about 5 dB. 4. And after. So you can hear that the hat is definitely less punchy and more of a constant sound. And that is going to give us that more lengthy hi-hat that I want. I'm going to use the has effect, which is just a stereo delay from um, one side of the mix to the other, from left to right or le right to left. And that's going to make it sound even wider. Just playing in one speaker left uh, first, and then the other speaker or headphone, and uh, it's going to make it sound very, very wide. It's going to trick our brain into thinking it's super wide. Next, we're going to have the punch hat. So I have a couple different things on here that I've laid out, and let's just take a listen. Stock. It's very punchy. Pretty sharp. I've cut off a bit of the tail end here. Probably leave that, that's fine. Compressor. Again, I wanted to take out that punch. It's a little bit too punchy for me. Uh, and then I filtered out some of the low end and the high end. It is a bit shrill of a sound, so I've cut out a little bit of the high. I've done the has effect again, but this time it's different. So instead of just doing it by 10 or 20 milliseconds, I've actually changed this from millisecond value to, to be synced with the tempo of the track. And it's gonna be at one. So what's gonna happen is my dry wet is at 30 now. So I can hear this quite a bit and it's gonna play the first hat and then it's going to repeat itself and play the second hat based on the beat division here, which is one. So it's gonna be a 16th. And then I've added this 2.6% uh, just to make it a little bit off. Very, very minimal amount, but just to make it sound a little bit off. That's way too much, just a couple percent. And then what I'm going to do is actually mono it. And this is the neat trick that you can easily just write in the actual drum rack by just going into your 16ths and just... But I thought that was a pretty cool trick, and then you can actually change the dry-wet. Be a little bit quieter, a little bit louder. 
Just a cool little trick that I'd like to share with you. And then I have this vocoder here. I'm actually going to take that off. I don't like the way that sounds. Okay, moving on. Where uh, This punch hat I don't have, so I'm going to delete that. And then I have this shaker groovy here. So this is going to be a shaker uh, loop that I made that I'm going to include in the sample pack. And the shakers are really important because they are going to give us a lot of that background groove. It's going to be more subtle, but it's going to be there to give the track. Uh, it's going to clean up some of the empty space in the, the high end where the hi-hats aren't touching. And it keeps the groove moving along as well. So I'll include that. And then this is actually really important too, the top noise. So what that means, uh, and actually I'll put these effects back on, just some simple reverb and some stereo widening. Uh, the top noise is something that a lot of progressive artists do. I notice Alex does it in some of his tracks. Essentially, it's just a, a noise that's very quiet that they kind of that or he kind of puts into his tracks to fill up some of the empty space. And it's important to note that there is some sidechain compression going on. So I'll dive into that. But really, what's happening is I've taken this shaker here. I've put a ton of reverb on it, uh, like 100% dry wet reverb, and this is what it sounds like. A little bit more decay time. And then I've recorded that. And it's just that, that reverb, but we could just use a reverb for this, but by actually recording it, we have more control over it and we can actually see what it looks like. And I've put some sidechain compression. So I have it from the drums, I'm gonna put it on my punch hat right here. So what's gonna happen is whenever the punch hat, this one here hits, it's going to duck down the volume of this top noise. It's very, very quiet. But this is going to make sure that I'm not interfering with the same frequencies that I am with the uh, the hat and that it's going to give us the appropriate punch from the punch hat. It's not going to be overlapped by this white noise here. And then last, I have this shaker loop. It's actually a shaker. And uh, this is just a shaker loop that I got out of a pack. I can't give this one to you because I don't own it, but I definitely recommend getting some really nice shaker loops because even just adding a simple shaker loop to the, the top end of your track, even a really quiet can add a lot of organic feel. So let's listen to all the hats together now. I'm doing the same thing with the punch hat. I'm punching through the shaker. So when the shakers are playing, that punch hat comes through and uh, turns down the volume of the shaker loop because I want that punch hat to be the most prominent hat that I have out of all the instruments that I have in the song because there is quite a, a few instruments, uh, quite a few drums. And with that punch hat coming through, it's going to keep the rhythm the best that it can. We have my clap. Simply just a clap that I chose, nice and soft sounding, not too aggressive. And then I made it a little bit shorter. And there's nothing really to that. So I'm going to go over these three percussive elements that I've also included. So I have the original loop at the top that I showed you, but this is something that I wanted to touch on. When you're writing in percussion like this, you want them to be hooky. You want them to be catchy and to fill the space in a proper way. And sometimes what I do is I just, like I did with my bass line, I play the track and then I just think of some hooky elements that I can put in and I kind of just, you know, maybe tap my hands. I'll play the kick by itself and then I'll just tap along. Or, and things like that, and then I'll actually just write them in. And then I'll turn them up. So I'll write in one, so it sounds like this. And then I'll actually turn that off and go to the next one. And I'll write in something different. I'll turn that one off, forget about it, and do this one. And then I listen to all three. And the reason for that is because if I do it this way, the sounds that I've already put in don't influence my decision on the next percussion that I'm putting in. And sometimes this helps and sometimes it doesn't, but this kind of makes it so that I'm not constricting myself to not put sounds, you know, on the same sp uh, space same note, maybe I, I just, I have a habit of saying, oh, you know what, there's already an instrument here, I don't need it, so I won't put it there. But sometimes they land on the same space and it sounds good. Uh, 
other things that might kind of constrict you is hearing the other progressive elements and that kind of makes you uh it kind of influences you to make decisions that you might not make just by hearing the groove of the entire track so this is something that i suggest you try at least try it out and see if it works for you it does for me and uh, if not then just uh you know do it your own way but something that i thought i would share and then I have this last percussive element that actually was originally part of the baseline that I had in mind. So I have the baseline, and then I have also this instrument here. So it's actually a tom. And it has quite a bit of low end to it. So I'm going to get rid of that. And it's important to note that it is also in key. So because it's such a low end instrument, I want to make sure that it's in key. And then that complements the bass line. So let's take a listen to that. Right, so that extra layer kind of complements the baseline this kind of helps the baseline uh feel a little bit more interesting because it's it's adding value to the bass without being super obvious so we're going to call that bass accent or bass accent tom and then lastly i have this percussive element come in a little bit later in the song something that adds a little bit and let's take a listen to all the drums by themselves. And then with the kick. And then with the bass. Right, so it's, it's all coming together and a lot of the drive of these tracks comes from the relationship between the kick bass and the drums uh a lot of alex's tracks they they have a lot of synths come in but it's not usually for a minute minute and a half even two minutes in the, the track that there hasn't really been that many instruments it's or sorry that that many synths it's mostly just the groove and the percussion and the bass so you have to make sure that it's hooky you have to make sure that it's interesting and that it works really well together last thing i'm going to do for the drums is put on a glue compressor and this uh, gentle squeeze compressor that I like to have when I'm writing my drums. It just makes them feel a little bit glued together. Um, so I'll bring my threshold down so I'm about getting about 5 dB of gain reduction. And then I'll put this up to about 5.5, maybe 6. And then turn my gentle squeeze on. And now we can listen again. Oh, I forgot that I added in this extra percussive element that I wanted to add in a little bit later, so I'll move that forward a little bit. We're just going to do a pretty short version of this uh, this track. You can phrase it how you like when you download the project file, but just to keep it nice and simple, I'm going to keep it pretty short and just imagine that you know this is going over a longer period of time. So we can listen to that. Just another hook to keep the track interesting. One other tip that I have for you is the hats. I have this saturator here and I also have another glue compressor. So the saturator is very similar to a compressor in that it reduces dynamic range. And by turning on the saturator, we're gonna get a little bit more volume, uh, but a little bit less dynamic. So let's listen to the hats by themselves with the saturator off then on. They feel a little bit more present now, a little bit more glued together. Lastly, we're going to focus on the synths, and this will be a little bit quicker than the drums because the drums are very intricate. Just like the Guy J video, uh, the drums take up most of the video. So uh, I have here the synths, not too, too much going on, um, but the main thing to consider is how to get these really long sustained um, sounds that Alex uses in his tracks, as well as how to get those like big splash effect. So it's really, really big uh, effects that he uses in a lot of his transitions in the beginnings of his track. So you'll notice a theme where a lot of his tracks and a lot of these similar artist tracks is they have these really, really long impacts. So I'll just grab a random impact here. 
And I'm gonna drag that onto, I'll put it onto impact one here, this first one channel. And then I have, so on this impact channel, I have what I've made called big delay. And it has a delay with the feedback all the way up to 91%, and then I have 100% dry wet, and then I have reverb with five seconds of decay time after that. So if we listen to this sound on its own, this is what it's gonna sound like. I guess we can all imagine what that was gonna sound like. But what's important is that when you incorporate that with the rest of the track, it kind of helps it pull forward and it kind of fills up some of the empty space that if the, if the loop starts to sound a little bit boring because you're listening to it so many times, these impacts and transitions really, really help keep the track alive. Unfortunately, they do get kind of annoying, so I'm just gonna turn the feedback down a little bit for now. Uh, but then, Another thing that I like to do is actually put an EQ here and take out some of that high um, end and some of the low end. So it's not interfering with our hats and we're not getting a lot of buildup in the low end. And let's take a listen again. Cool. And that's what Alex does in a lot of his tracks, these, these big impacts and maybe he'll add another, you know, a symbol or another layer onto there. Reverse it and do something like this. Cool. So let's take out the baseline for this part and let's do a little reverse for where the base actually comes in. So I'll do it here and then I'll duplicate this to impact and then we can take a listen. What's important to take away is that we've added this, you know, impact. And it transitioned really nice into the bass line. And we can add some white noise as well. So that sounds a little bit more organic. And I'll leave that for now. So now we're going to dive into the synths and look at what we can use to really elevate this track in terms of adding that extra layer of beauty to it. And that is what Alex does in so many of his tracks is just by adding these soaring leads and pads over the entirety of the track. I'll just put that there for a marker. Maybe we'll grab Simplest Piano for this. So throw that on there and take a listen to how it sounds. So this sound isn't the most intricate, but I just wanna show you that you can make these sounds with pretty much anything, um, as long as you use the right effects. And it might not sound the best, but you can find really, really good stuff. So I'm gonna grab a reverb, throw that on there, delay, throw that on there, auto pan, throw that on there, and then a little bit of auto pan, rate's pretty slow, feedback quite high, dry wet, down to maybe 30, and then uh, the reverb, maybe a little bit past 50. Keep the low cut out. Sorry if I'm talking too fast. This video is getting pretty long. Uh, and then decay time pretty high. And then what you can do is you can really crank this decay time. Hold that note, sustain. And you can go even further and you can actually make a loop here. So we can turn on looping. I can move this down here, crossfade. I'll bring this tail end a little bit shorter. Sounds pretty good. Maybe turn the gain up a little bit because we are dealing with this area. Uh, and I'll actually crop the sample so that we don't have that big part there. 
Listen to how great that sounds. So let's go. I'll hit record. Cool. Not the best playthrough, but you get the idea. That should be gone. And then let's hear that. That sounds. Maybe I'll add a little bit. Yep, I have some automation there. So I have the kick being filtered out. And let's take a listen. I'm actually going to do that down here as well. Where is that? That's here. And duplicate everything over. Hey everybody, I just want to take a second to interrupt the video to let you know about the online monthly coaching, one on one lessons, and online production courses that I have to offer. I offer one-on-one -on -one video lessons via Skype, so we can work on your track, feedback, mixing, mastering, anything that you want to learn, we can tackle in a one-on-one -on -one video call session. Monthly coaching includes these video sessions as well as email feedback, free downloads, among other things, and the online courses are a learn-at-your-own-pace method that you can dive into and take as long as you need and go back as often as you want to learn as well. Check the description below for a link to those as well as some free downloads in the description as well. There we go. And we'll take a listen from here. I'm going to add another impact here. Uh, I'm going to reverse this one because a lot of the time Alex has these, you know, these big impacts coming through. And bring this down a little bit. And then we have that sound there. So I'm going to actually filter in some of this high end as well. So I'll grab an auto filter, put that on the right before the reverb. And I'm going to control the frequency. So show automation. And let's take a listen to that one more time. And then I'm going to duplicate this over here. So let's add one more sound to this, one more pad, and it's that pad is going to build as this melody is playing. Uh, I'm gonna go here. Let's take um, let's take a pigments, and if you don't have pigments, don't worry. This will work with many different synths. Uh, I just love using pigments because it has really beautiful sounds. So I'm going to go all types. Let's do mm, let's do pad. Let's see what missing sock sounds like. <laughs> Missing socks. Oh yeah, honey. That's what my missing socks sound like. I'm gonna go down an octave. Let's take a listen to how this sounds. Turn this up. Cool. Cool. 
So uh, that riser was down here. This is another thing I wanted to show you with this big delay. Putting a huge reverb and delay on something like this riser, if I turn them off, this is what it sounds like. But with this huge delay and reverb, sounds pretty wild. Um, and I do that, but I don't actually drop it in the same time as the drop. So the drop, the drop is here, but I actually stop it here so that I have all this time here for like that crazy delayed reverb effect. Right. And I don't have the baseline over here, but let's move that over and let's move all the drums over as well. And that is pretty much it. The main idea for a lot of Alex's elements in his leads are just, these leads have tons of reverb and sustain on them and just really play along uh, to the track and just try not to focus so much about making some of the melodies line up exactly. You can see here that a lot of these notes, they're not really repetitive. They're kind of just going a little willy nilly willy-nilly on the, the phrasing here and that gives it a sense of wonder I guess like you don't really know what's coming next and it just makes you feel a little bit like vibey in it you almost feel lost because you don't really know what's playing in terms of what's coming next or what's already happened you, you kind of lose sense of phrasing and it makes you feel really into into the music and at least that's what where um what I pull from it so um having you know a couple elements that are carrying the track that are repetitive, these hooks, these drums, these bass lines, they're keeping the track in rhythm, they're keeping the track in time and the phrasing, but then you have these soaring leads that are kind of breaking the rules and they're flowing over the next phrases and the reverb and the tail is taking them into the next phrase and overlapping and that's really what makes the tracks sound so huge and so wide. I, I'd like to show you that I can really any sound that is pretty uh, melodic like this, like a piano, a vocal, um, certain percussive elements even, adding the right amount of reverb and delay can make it sound really good. It's not gonna work all the time, but uh, using the simplest piano is a really good technique. It comes with uh, stock with Ableton, and then just grabbing random presets. Like even if I change this preset, if I change that to something else, It still sounds great. And something else that you can do is automate this as it's going, like I did before with the uh, with the filter. So um, just you know, the, the huge reverb delay, add a filter on there, and as the track is progressing, start filtering out, start opening up and closing that filter, and, and making it interesting as the track's going on, and kind of keep the listener guessing. I'm going to turn the drums down a little bit. I'm going to turn the kick and the bass down a little bit as well. And we're going to have one final playthrough of the entire track. Um, I do want to put the drums quite loud. Alex, in a lot of his tracks, his drums are quite loud. Um, one more thing about the drums, and I know I keep going back to the drums, but they're so important in, in these tracks. And that is that your, your hats and your percussive elements, they really, really... A lot of the time in Alex's tracks in Progressive House, uh, they sound very glued together. They're very, very um, together in a sense. And they're not that they're all the same volume, but there's a lot of compression. There's a lot of saturation. They just feel like one full top unit. And uh, that gives a lot of the room for the track to groove without being too cut and dry, too, um, you know, choppy and a lot of the, the drums sound really fluent and vibey and wavy if you don't have too many elements really punching through. So of course you want like one or two hats punching through sometimes and the clap and, and everything else, but nothing that's super, super obviously like taking your attention away is uh, sometimes the route that these guys take. So you can hear that the drums are pretty crispy, a lot going on, but not any of the drums are overly loud. So 
So let's take a listen one more time to the entire track. I'm gonna add, um, that's good, like that. Uh, I'll add one more impact to the drop. Drop. That is it, ladies and gents. Uh, make sure that if you're still watching this video, you are a ledge. You are one of my favorite people, for sure, because this was a long video, and uh, it's truly inspiring that people are still watching these videos that I'm creating and learning from them. So thank you so much for watching, and I really hope you learned something, and please let me know in the comments if you learned something, um, because that really, really means a lot to me. Before we listen one more time, I moved the baseline up a little bit so it's at the one minute mark. I moved these back a little bit so that it's at the 45 seconds. Uh, and then I'm going to move these back so that they are um, keeping the song interesting as it's progressing. And I took out some of the sounds in the intro. Let's take a listen. Everybody, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. If you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe. And if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Also make sure to grab that link below, get access to the Ableton Project files from this video and other ones, as well as some of the presets, some of the samples, and some of the audio files used in this project, as well as the other ones.